Hello. I'm Caleb, and I really like bugs. Today, I want to talk to you about my favorite bugs, macroinvertebrates. <laughs> they may not look like much, but these creatures are totally rad. So just what is a macroinvertebrate anyway? Well, a macroinvertebrate, as its name implies, is a spineless critter that can be seen with the naked eye. Sorry there, tardigrade. You didn't make the cut. You are too tiny. In streams, we'll see three major fellows who do make the cut. These include the worms, the mollusks, and the arthropods. Now the arthropods are of particular importance because they include the insects. The stream insects we see include mayflies, odonates, stoneflies, hemipterans, caddisflies, helgramites, beetles, and true flies. Oh my god. So many bugs out there. I love bugs. Since this is the coolest group, we'll focus on them from here on out. Let's talk ecology. Insects can live anywhere from a few weeks, like this coronamid midge, to several years, like this pteranarsis. They also exhibit one of two major life history strategies. Some insects are hemimetabolous. This basically means that the eggs give rise to nymphs, which look pretty much like adults, but are missing wings. These little fellows will molt several times and grow and form wing pads which will eventually turn into winged adults. Other insects, in fact, most insects, are holometabolous. In this fashion, eggs give rise to larvae, which can look and function completely different from adults. They are usually real good at eating and growing, and once big enough, they will go into a pupil stage to rearrange all their innards and metamorphose into winged adults. Now in order to grow, bugs gotta eat lots of ways they can do this. Here's what insect mouth parts look like. It looks complicated as all hell. So instead, we're just gonna pretend that my arms are bug mandibles. Now with the right tools, these guns can adapt to feed on dang near anything. For instance, if there's lots of algae around, I could specialize on it as a scraper and use my mandible to scrape it right off the substrate. I could also specialize as a collector and get real good at collecting small organic bits in the water column. Or I could tackle larger organic materials as a shredder and just shred those things up. Or better yet, if you're tired of eating boring plants, you can arm up and eat your neighbor. Now, a rather common pastime in the invertebrate world is becoming dinner. Bugs play an important role in nutrient cycling. Think of a bug as a vessel. Once it fills up with nutrients, it can transport them to other places in the water or even on land, often because of predation. This process works to counteract the natural depletion of nutrients downstream. Peeps always say, yeah, that's great now, Caleb, but why should I care about your bugs? Well, there's lots of reasons. First reason, fly fishing. If you know what kind of bugs are in the water, then you'll know what kind of patterns to tie, and then you'll get more fish. Second reason, macroinvertebrates form the base of a complex food web. Without them, the entire system will collapse. Now why should you care about that? because these systems provide important resources for folks like you and I. Third reason. Macroinvertebrates are stream health indicators. There's a variety of macroinvertebrate indices that you can use to monitor stream health. 
That's because different insects have different sensitivities to adverse water quality. The index we're going to talk about is the biotic index. With the biotic index, the bugs you catch are ranked according to their sensitivity. Bugs can be sensitive to pollution, sedimentation, low dissolved oxygen, and high temperature. If you acquire a lot of sensitive taxa, then you have yourself a healthy stream. Conversely, if you acquire a lot of tolerant taxa, then your stream might not be that healthy. In fact, it might be very poor water quality. This makes sense because only the tolerant taxa are looking. They're very tolerant of bad water quality. So now I reckon you're wondering how to get your paws on some of these bugs. Well, I've got just a sample method for you. One kick net, an ice tray, and another tray. Once you find a nice ripple, you're gonna take your kick net and you're gonna plant it firmly into the substrate. Now you can kick up the sediment just in front of the kick net to dislodge insects. Kick for 30 seconds, then scrub with your hands for another 30 seconds. Dislodged insects will naturally flow downstream and into your net. If you're taking multiple kicks, be sure to work upstream rather than downstream. This way, your previous kicks won't bias later ones. Woo! Once you have your bug, you're gonna take it back over to your bucket. All right, so over here, we've got our sorting station. So I've got bugs in here, got a sorting tray, and then I've got my ice tray. So I'm going to use some fancy handy dandy forceps, and I'm going to pick bugs out and just enter the tray. One bug, two bugs, three bugs, four bugs, more bugs. One thousand and one. One thousand two. All right, so now I got my thousand and two and a half bugs in here, and I'm gonna go ahead and sort them into these ice trays. So here's my perlid. That's my perlid wheel. There's another perlid. There's a flathead. There's another flathead. I got a black fly larva. Got another perlid. Got a rhyacophyla. Got a hydrocycid. That's another perlid. Here's some of the bugs I sorted. Once you have them ID, release the bugs! Remember kids, this is a coarse field sampling technique. Ideally, you'd want to take the bugs home, subsample, and then ID to genus or species. But don't stop there. Be sure to bring your friends along too. I'm talking about geologists, hydrologists, other ecologists, and policymakers too. Everyone's got something important to bring to the table, and together you could reliably conserve a watershed.